All right. Everybody. Mike. Oh. Is it not working? All right. I'll Um, so today, here we are to present the subscriber billing system we built on a commodity hardware. Um, I am Vikram, and I'm an architect at Verizon. Um, this project and uh, my colleague, Bom Jun will actually show the demo. Um, this project we picked up a year or so back, so most of the people who actually worked on this project are not here, but the TC and the kernel experts are here. So we have a back-to-back -back TC talk, so I hope uh, you don't fall asleep. So. Let's uh, get there. So I'll start with something. I mean, I had some conversations last night with people here. Um, some of you understand the EPC architecture well. Uh, but for the people who are not um, abreast with it, so I'll, I'll take a few minutes to explain how typical telco runs their billing. Um, so if you look at this picture, I mean, the idea is that from RAN to internet, there are a bunch of forwarding elements. I mean, uh, we call it S gateway, P gateway, but there's a long chain of network elements which are running through the network. And then there's some control functions which could be centralized, um, but there's some aspects of control also within the inline functions which actually set policies. Um, and these forwarding elements um, um, basically are controlled through these interfaces. Um, 3GPP is a body to standardize these interfaces so that when we buy stuff from vendors, everybody can comply and interoperate. Um, I'll highlight a few of those boxes for you. Uh, one is the PCR, which is important. So when you call us and say, hey, I want a different uh, billing plan, or I want a different uh, service, um, typically we will actually enforce static policies on these boxes, and they'll actually get programmed over 24 hour period. Um, similarly, OCS is the one which actually maintains your credit. So when you buy a plan for four uh, gigabytes, that's where we run the credit system. Uh, those are the systems which are connected to alerting, and that's how you get alerts. Um, and then finally, then the, the part which uh, we have most impact on monetary-wise is the offline charging system. These are basically time-based records which are shipped across the network. Um, in one of the studies we did, um, essentially we had 18 different data store points. Um, if I just roughly do some calculation around uh, every 30 minute we cut this record, or 18 data points on 100 million subscribers, it adds up very fast. So around 2.5 trillion records would show up. So this is how um, we lay out our billing uh, uh, network today. But this is not what we wanted. When we started off this project, we wanted to simplify this picture. So let me show you what vision we had, really. Um, thank you. So the first thing we wanted to do was um, get rid of all the boxes, um, set up a controller somewhere in the cloud, and actually have a programmable infrastructure. Um, we didn't uh, envision that we want to solve all the protocol problems, but we had specific uh, cases which we wanted to solve. Uh, the first being that we should not be having multiple data storage points, so we should not be having multiple databases drawn the billing lane, but also like a user could uh, program through an app what kind of billing service he needs, and it should get enforced in the network right away. Uh, so the APIs um, and network itself should be programmable from a Verizon app. So if you look at this picture carefully, uh, the idea is that the business applications are essentially um, the services which are running, which will connect to the Verizon apps, and they do a trigger a restful call, and these translate into actual policies. Um, the talk before highlighted some aspect of uh, using and SGN control to program TC rules. Um, so we extended it to a real life situation. We actually have a SDN controller which inserts the, the real policies and we get a feedback uh, in real time back from a programmed infrastructure. Um, for the simplicity, we just use x86 card as our programmable infrastructure. But yeah, that was the vision we had when we started. Thank you. So now if I really normalize how these forwarding elements work, you will see every element in our network for the packet who is running to the internet follows these class of functions. They basically, the packets get into the port, we classify them. Um, if there's a GDP protocol running, we'll do a decapsulation, we'll further figure out what policies to apply, and then forward it or shape it and send it back out to the port. So across all the elements, these are the basic, most basic functions. Now, what is missing in this picture? Anybody? Uh, the hint is 
it's a billing system. So probably if you look at it, if we just added some function in this forwarding pipeline to count, I think all the headaches of managing multiple boxes and multiple interfaces probably might be simplified. So let's go to the next slide, I think. So don't get scared with the, no, no, go back, yeah. Don't get scared with the big picture, but I hope you can see the forwarding plane down. Um, essentially, the previous slide, when it showed the data path pipeline, the one function which we was missing in the data path pipeline was to account for bytes. Um, so what we did was we used the uh, TC as a mechanism to instantiate this data path pipeline. Um, if you look at the structure below, it essentially has um, um, sets of classifier actions. Um, I'm, I'm assuming most of the people here know TC. Um, if not, Jamal runs TC workshop. So I think, but to give an idea, we need to filter packets and we need to chain a bunch of actions. The chain of actions, which I showed before, is the typical chain of actions networks run. So from the, from the egress side, if I look at it, if the chain is programmed from right to, light, uh, sorry, right to left, um, the, there's a some function called QE, which we developed, which we'll actually show you today. And there's a bunch of polices, and there's a filter to actually identify these chains. Now, the, this is very simplistic in view, but when you actually deploy, uh, what we are showing here is an operator's view of how this service will typically run. Whether this is actually deployed the same way at Verizon, we won't be able to comment on that, but this gives you a model of how we want to program uh, our network in future. Um, so some of the instructions which I'm showing, uh, the red lines, are actually control instructions which are affecting parts of this data path pipeline. And then I have a bunch of things going out uh, to, the B, to the cloud. Um, these are mostly the blue lines. Uh, I don't know if you can read it, but the idea being that when a packet shows up, um, I know that you, your phone number is tied to a particular IP address. From that, I could figure out what kind of services have you subscribed for. And those services are pre-configured in form of this QE chain. Um, and once I know what type of uh, services you want, I can associate an SKB mark with a packet. The packet goes in again, and I actually service you. The one part which people might ask is, why did you actually do a user space transaction there? Why couldn't we just run it in kernel? We can possibly run the service in kernel without interaction with user uh, space, but um, we wanted to do a little bit more sophistication. We wanted to understand the consumer behavior, what apps are they running. Um, I know somebody talked about encrypting SNI with me last night, but uh, still most of the traffic which runs today, 40% is HTTP. So we can do lots of parsing, and also still a lot of the, lot of the SNIs are not encrypted yet. So we can get real data about a consumer behavior, and that's what the analytics field is about. So we understand what our subscribers are consuming, at what time, um, possibly at what rate too. So that's the view we had, and uh, I don't know if I want to go into the cloud, but you're more than welcome to ask me questions if you have any. Okay. So now let me dig into the piece we actually developed and we're going to contribute. Um, this is the idea that we wanted to centralize the credit and the accounting in one state. Um, so what I'm showing you is a, uh, is a very naive picture where the green actually represents your four gigabytes quota. And just imagine it's actually squeezing as you're consuming data. And the blue one is the left allowance that you have. Um, when you, once you run out, there are possible actions we could do is we could drop you or we could actually rate limit you, or we could just continue to give you service but charge you differently, right? So these are the possible actions we could attach with. Um, the one thing which is of interest uh, for people is uh, when you store these transactions um, in kernel, we need a hash index to uh, go and identify a database entry as fast as possible. So we actually inserted something called cookie, which actually will identify not only the MDN, but the services it's associated with. This 128-bit cookie is actually a direct index into the database, um, so that helps. Um, and yeah, the idea is that the packet just run through, so you're deducting the credit, and at the same time, you're accounting it. So the synchronization problems don't happen. Um, so that's the accounting which, which actually goes to the user space, which we store um, in some distributed database to actually make it work. Now, the logic of the QA is actually on the right-hand side, uh, which actually highlights 
how the packet arrives. Um, we check the packet length. We remove the excess adders. Um, we check if the code is within the length of the packet. If so, we actually go and run uh, and increment the counts, and we let it go. If not, there are possible actions are that we actually can drop it. OK. Next one, please. Thank you. So people might ask this question that, why did you guys actually use DC uh, to build these data path pipelines? And the logical question is, um, to answer is, if I'm using a commodity hardware, and I'm using a TC, what would be the performance of TC uh, at scale? So this is actually how our network is set up today. Um, we have a Juniper router, and we actually extensively use VLAN tags um, to identify the service cards which are sitting behind the plane, if you look at it. Those are the XATIS cards. And the, these, the inner VLANs in this actually identify the direction of the traffic. So um, from that, we know whether it was an uplink packet or a downlink packet. On the right side um, is essentially a very simplistic chain and kernel. Um, I haven't shown all the actions there. But essentially, when a packet shows up, we want to pop the VLAN, now we're going to classify, and we want to push the VLAN again and out. Um, so we actually scaled it. I mean, in the paper, we highlight the, the hardware configuration. You could go and read it. But there's like 128,000 TC graphs. We scaled it to that level. And we actually pushed traffic at different rates. Um, so the numbers we have, I think, next slide, boom. So next slide actually highlights uh, what our intention was to see, can we actually do this at line rate without uh, introducing latencies, which we typically experience in the forwarding elements today. So roughly, the latency of a packet from RAN to internet is probably 40 milliseconds. So you can imagine how many hops they're going through and how, uh, how much it consumes. But with using this infrastructure, if you look at it, our, the latencies are in microseconds. And uh, um, the, if you look at the higher packet size, it's almost equal to the line rate. Um, so it, it doesn't compromise us on the latency, which is important for us. Um, so yeah, the, these were basically the actual numbers. Um, for details on the setup and everything, you can consult paper. But that should uh, show you the power of this uh, TC. So a bunch of challenges we faced um, while developing QE. Uh, and the team actually fixed these changes in kernel. And I think some of them are already upstream. Um, but I think um, Bomjun's code will actually come later. Um, and we'll probably upstream that too and share the GitHub repository. But I think if you look at it, um, when you naturally run a service of that scale, you have so many graphs. And uh, a subscriber could choose different graphs at different point in time. Uh, collecting stats is going to be a problem. Um, so what we did was um, we don't want to collect all the non-moving stats out of the kernel. So we actually inserted a time filter. So you could actually say from the user app, I am requesting uh, from this time to this time uh, the stats which are moving so that I don't have to collect all the stats which haven't changed. So that was one fix. Um, also, there was an artificial limit on the number of actions you could pack in a batch. And um, I don't know why that was there, but essentially, I think the team fixed, uh, uh, based on the actual memory in the socket, how much can we pack in that? And that would be sent as a single batch. So those were the mostly performance uh, problems we saw uh, shipping stats out to the cloud. Instruction-wise, we didn't have much problem setting the control instructions into the fast path. That was not a problem. Thank you. So the other parts was data path performance. And what I'm highlighting mostly are the performance results I showed you before. How were we able to achieve that? We actually enabled RSS on the NIC, and we <coughs> used RSS and SKB mark to identify and run the chain, which I showed you before. And um, we, I think this was already checked in into the kernel, I think the 128k um, hash bucket size. Um, the biggest, uh, if you look at the chain, the biggest consumption uh, was actually the filter. So the filtering, I think, was limited to, I think, 16. Um, uh, Jamal would remember. But this is the fix to actually in increase the hash bucket size to make it faster. Um, then there were a bunch of challenges we had um, with using single uh, prior queue disk. Um, so we actually used multi-queue priority, uh, sorry, multi-queue prior disk. 
And also we had some changes in TCV LAN actions because they were using spin locks to be updated to RCU. And I think so QE now is also RCU. I, now, I can comment right? on, the, on the hash. I think that's, we suggested to fix the TC action hash, but the IDR patch that came from Chris Me from Mellanox was the final solution. I so see. We, don't, we don't need that patch anymore. Awesome. Thank you. So yeah, that's, that's primarily our data path performance problems and challenges, and those are some of the fixes we have contributed. All right, so this is demo time. Um, what we're going to show is a very simplistic demo. Uh, we won't be able to show you the entire operator view at this point, but um, these are three containers, I, I guess, Bob June, right? Yeah. And the instruction set is shown on the left. All we're going to show you is um, a client connected to the router. Router will have a QE action set. At a certain point in time, I think you're going to drop the packets, right, after you run out of credit. Um, so yeah. So I'll just briefly describe the arrows here, the, the cool arrows going around. Um, so from a client, if you look at the, the red arrow, which is going, um, basically it is a transaction going to the server. Uh, we actually have a QE programmed on the egress QDIS, which is the web interface there. So the packets show up on the red, red router at zero. They run through the QE. And I think he has programmed a, a source IP and destination IP, I think. Yeah for the client, so that every packet emanating from the client and coming to the client runs through a QE. And if you look at carefully on the instruction set, I think the QE credit is almost like a megabyte? One uh, megabyte? 10 megabyte. 10 megabyte, okay. And yeah, so what we'll see is actually after some time, um, the file, I think you're transferring a file from a server to the client, and it'll stop. And you will see the stats from the, this action, and we'll see how these stats actually become actual CDRs for billing purposes in our network. Go ahead, Bamjan. Put on the mic. So, you know, uh, for this demo, I have a few helper scripts. Um, so, um, zero dash setup script uh, will um, enable the IP for the option to one, and um, uh, it creates the server, router, client namespace, and creates the uh, VS fast devices for those namespaces and uh, it just assigns the IP address to the each uh, fast devices and using the route command it just um, add a route to uh, from server to client. Are you able to make the font uh, a little larger? Can you increase the font maybe unless people can see this? Okay. Uh, pardon? Uh, is a, can you make the font bigger or? Uh, Okay. And just as a warning, you don't have much time. Shift control plus, try. Yeah. Uh, would this be good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it looks better, yes. Yeah, so yeah, I'm I'm just creating the um, namespace and the uh, VES devices and um uh, running the route command in order to create the uh, um, route. So I'm just going to run it. Um, and this helper script will run the um, TC command that uh, we described previously. Yeah, so it shows the this command that is ran in the this script. And uh, here, um, um, so, uh, yeah, 
credit is set to um, almost 110 megabit. Uh, just a second. Yeah, so um, it should be the upstream byte pass byte and ah, this should be the upstream pass byte and this should be the downstream pass byte and let's learn the actual demo. Um, this demo will just use the um, TCP uh, sender from the server side and TCP, TCP receiver from the client side. So the file transfer uh, stopped because it reached its quota. Yeah, so here is the amount of byte that went to the upstream. Here is the amount of the byte that uh, is downloaded. And this is the, uh, what is left. So um, if I just add them, Exact number. All right. Yeah. So I think what he showed here is a very simple idea which you can scale. Yeah, like, sorry. I mean, this this idea can be scaled to any environment. If you are actually looking to, I saw the previous presentation, to use DC infrastructure in cloud environments, you could actually look at this as a way to count uh, bytes going into containers. Um, you could run it across uh, hosts, so I think this is pretty scalable that way. So, okay. So you want to revert back to? So I, I, I think we are done. So if you have some questions, there's something about building data pipelines around these models, um, which I'm super excited about. If somebody wants to know how to actually build recommendation engines, um, I'll be more than happy to talk about that. But that's all in cloud. Questions. Okay, I have a question. Boom, Jun, when are you putting out the patch again? Are you going to submit the, the QE action? Uh, are you going to submit the QE action to the list? Um, yeah. Okay. Am I putting yeah. you on the spot? <laughs> you, you, you know, this is how we work here. You have to, you have to push that code upstream. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll maintain some and then eh? clean up the code. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's upstream. I, I push that patch actually. But yeah, yeah. So in TC, in in the actions you code, you can say, I want you to dump something. I don't know if you looked at that. And you provide a filter, which restricts, which will look at the time last used. And it says, is it greater than five, the time you passed, five seconds? Then it won't give it to you if it hasn't been used in the last five seconds. So when you have, I think we had it close to. In this case, we had. 256,000 uh, actions, you then only dump 5,000 because the, the other cell phone users had never crossed. By the way, the hardware was a Connect X3. I know he didn't mention that, I think, but we were proud we were able to get that thing to work. I don't know, it still exists. Uh, all right, thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you.